Hey, what's going on, everybody? This is Justin. We are on the fifth episode of Survival of the Artist podcast. And today I'm real excited to have somebody I've, I've actually never interviewed before, but I've met him, which is strange. Um, it is Jared Sanders of God Over Money. Jared, what's up, man? Hey, what's going on, man? You know, another day, another nickel, I guess. A nickel. <laughs> Just collecting those nickels. Now, yeah. I, I really like, side, side note to people listening, not just because Jared's on the phone, but I really, really dig Jared's music because as someone in New York City who listens to that like New York 90s hip hop and really, really likes, and I had this argument with someone the other day, quote unquote, real hip hop, which could mean anything for a bunch of different people, but a certain group of people know what real hip hop means. I feel like, Jared, you're in that category of real hip-hop. Ah, that's appreciated, man. Just trying to uh, keep, to keep the mantle burning, man. That's all. <laughs> so for, for those listening who may not know who you are, who are you, what do you do, and what would you, which ironically, what would be your claim to fame, even though your last album's called Nobody Famous? Uh, I'm a dad. Um... To like two kids now because I got a two month old as of tomorrow. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and a two year old. So um, I'm a dad. I'm a husband first, though. Um, I guess I guess the kids get uh, what's left after marriage. Um, <laughs> and then, <laughs> uh, you know, I, uh, you know, I eat junk food and you know, I get angry with people in traffic every now and again. Um, you know, I, I used to play video games. I don't too much anymore. Um, but, but you know, I like rap music, and, you know, I tend to rap every once in a while. So, I mean, if there was a claim to fame, um, I was uh, I had a couple accolades, you know, a couple acknowledgments from, like, you know, Sway and King Tech and DJ Revolution and, um, you know, DJ Z from DJ Booth and uh, a couple of... Uh, a couple of uh, tastemakers in the industry, but you know, I mean, nobody would really know that, and that's why I'm nobody famous. You you said that pretty humbly, so. <laughs> I, but you good, man. You word, good. Word. You good. You like you, you you really took it in. You like junk food. You really broke it down. Um, yeah. But but that's dope because that you're keeping it real. So, how long? And this this is a subjective question, I guess, but. How long did it take you to get where you're at now with music? Now, for everybody, they um, may not think they, they, they got anywhere or they may think they're at their peak or their pinnacle. Like, for where you are and I guess your, your comfortability level and what you're doing with music, how long did it take you to get where you're at? Uh, funny story, man. I actually uh, started as a singer, man. I was an uh, R&B singer. Um, I started... Uh, Started really trying to take it seriously, probably at the age of 16. Um, you know, I was singing at the lunch table, singing the girls I had crushes on, <laughs> at probably about 14 years old. Um, and uh, I did that up until um, I went to FAMU in Tallahassee um, and uh, did a couple years uh, there, uh, dropped out and uh, moved. Funny story, I moved in with uh, my ex-girl's mom in New Jersey, in Orange, New Jersey. Um, okay. And at that time, you know, I was trying to pursue the singing thing uh, to the point that, you know, I got homesick probably after about 10 months, uh, moved back to Florida, um, uh, did some uh, songwriting and some placements for some uh, major and independent uh, nice. recording artists. And... Uh, Eventually, man, I landed at home because I was flat broke and I uh, was was tired of my ex-girl. So I moved uh, home <laughs> with my parents um, in like 2010. I uh, still doing the songwriting thing, but, um, you know, doing some ghost writing. And uh, I ended up trying to be a, a MC right around 2011. I had a co-worker who was a rapper. Um, and I, uh, decided to do a hook on the record for him. It got passed on to a, a guy who I ended up signing with for a temporary period of time called DJ KO. 
out mm-hmm. of uh, uh, New Jersey, and um, I did a hook for the the, the homies record, and uh, Ko heard it, wanted me on a couple of their compilations, and I did that as a singer. But then I sent him a record where I sung the hook on it, but I also tried to rap a verse on it, and uh, Kenan was a little harsh. He he kind of, but he did it in such a passive aggressive way. He was like, "Hey man, uh, you know." I, I, I think your rapping is cool, but you know how like Usher on uh, on uh, Nice and Slow has like a little rap part on there? Like that's your lane. Like you know how like Miguel has a little semi-rap spoken word part? Yeah, that's your lane. And I think that put the battery in my back. So from then on, I was like, oh, no. Like I took it as a challenge, as a writer, as a creative to, to, to be better than uh, everybody on the roster. You know, I was like, oh, no, I'll right. be better than everybody. And, and just use that as motivation. And, you know, it piqued my, and piqued my, uh, uh, my intellect, and, and it got me to the point where I wanted to rap. Uh, from, so from 2011 to now, you know, aside from, you know, obviously when you're in high school, you kind of freestyle at the lunch table. But mm-hmm. uh, seriously, in about 2011, I started trying to be like a rapper, rapper, and I ain't looked back since. Yeah, and and for those listening who are like, yeah, but he's probably only a rapper because he really couldn't sing. Yo, you could sing. I, that's, <laughs> I and I told you on that on that song. Um, now I can't even think of the name. That song where you were the feature. With D Black, with with D Black, Good Day. Right, right. Yeah. And, and and then you were so happy doing it too. So you definitely yeah, yeah, you yeah, definitely yeah. could sing, man. So Yeah, man. So you 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 managed to figure out two different um lanes for creating art and you could do them both well. So so props to you. So Hey man, appreciate it. Where where do you think you would have gone had you not made the shift to a rapper? Like if you could speculate. And and if I recall from from hearing you speak at one of your shows, you weren't always a Christian artist either, right? Right, right, right. So yeah, if, if you um, didn't make this shift, where do you think you would have been? Um, if I didn't make the shift, uh, one to an MC, um, I, I, I had a couple record deals at the time, uh, a couple of deals and offers on the table. Um, one of them, I had kind of poor, you know, shoddy management. And it kind of, uh, that deal kind of fell through as, uh, you know, at the time, Arista was doing a big overturn. So, you know, when they bring in new management, mm-hmm. you know, old artists go, um, no matter how new they are, because uh, they want to bring in their people. And, you know, um, be, that'll be like the artist that is like the kid you, who hits the good grades and you put them on the refrigerator. Like, they kind of wanted their people to be that. Yeah. So I was one of the casualties of war. Um and then, you know, as an MC, uh, before, so yeah, I'd probably be an R&B singer somewhere because I was, you know, writing for people. Um, the, the, the record deal as a singer was, was going to happen at some point. Um, I just, you know, switched it up at some point. Do you ever, now I'm wondering, do you ever sort of fight yourself in your head when you're writing something? Like, do you, do you ever hear a beat and you hear it as a singer? first or you hear it as a rapper like how do you like obviously there's two different ways you can go with the track so how does that how does that work out for you um i'll be honest man i it really just depends um you know some records sound like they are singing records but what i do now more than ever as since since i really tap into the, the creative and songwriter side a lot of times i'll hear the voice of the person that I want to sing it and I'll write it and I'll give it to them to do. Like, and I did that and I do that quite a few times. So I hear, you know, melody as a singer, just as much as I will rhymes as a rapper, you know, it just gets to the point where, you know, now I understand, um, how, because I think every song doesn't have to be your song. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, as a, if if you're really a creative, if you're really a writer, like everything doesn't have to be um, for you to be at the forefront of the uh, the goal in the song. So sometimes I just hear 
you know, different vocal tones. And I'm like, hmm, who has this tone? Who has that tone? So I'll write it with that person in mind and I'll have them do it, you know, and uh, then I can stick to just the rapping. But, you know, I kind of produce it. I break it down. I'm like, hey, I want a bridge here. You know, hey, I want, you know, some backing vocals here, kind of. Right. You know, I play the producer role too. Yeah, and I think it gives you an edge, definitely, that you know how to sing because most lyrical rappers, I would say, don't really you know they don't do melody like they don't they don't they can't sing and there's always somebody for the hook but you can just kind of paint that entire picture in your head whether you want to sing it or not um and you know exactly how you want it to sound because you could actually create that sound so right right exactly yeah i think that's i think that's pretty dope um now shifting gears for and getting more into the surviving as an artist now um, you use your platform for a couple of different things. Like you have your hashtag Hope Hop. Um, you drop your sermonettes on Instagram that I see every morning. Uh, you like life building with people and giving advice. You even tell like a lot of jokes. So um, right. for you, you know, what was the strategy in going in this route? And maybe before you were doing this stuff, like what sort of growth and engagement? have you seen just on the social media and just doing things like this? Oh man. Um, the, the growth has been exponential. Um, now I've kind of been doing this, um, for a while, uh, as far as, uh, you know, the, the positive quotes and the inspirational stuff and the jokes and the memes and the gifts and all of that. I've been doing that since before I came over to, to the Christian rap side of anything. Mm-hmm. I used to just call it food for thought. Um, and I was, you know, writing, you know, my opinions on things and matters. And um, I think the main reason for it is I didn't just want to come off as a salesman, you know, because I've always felt like those social media platforms, those pages, those, they kind of bore me because it looks like your your timeline is one big billboard, right? And yeah, it's like, yeah. Like, like ads. And it's like, hey, look at this, look at this, look at this, here's the music. And I'm like, okay that's kind of, I don't like that. Um, and in most cases for me, when I go to find out about an artist, I start looking at their interviews. Like I start looking at their social media, um, their Instagram aesthetics. I start looking at, you know, the things that would appeal to me as like a person outside of music. Right. Um, and what it is about that person that, that inspires me to, to look further into the story. Like what's your story? So for me, when it comes to social media, you know, I just want people to know I'm a funny guy who loves his <laughs> wife, who loves his kids, who, you know, um, thinks things about God and thinks things about society and culture. And, and I'm willing to say some things that sometimes people don't want to say and, you know, engage some topics people don't want to engage in. And, uh, I also make music. So like, cause I think advertising marketing, they'll tell you, man, it's like people buy a person before the product. Yeah. Um, they, they, they want to invest in and feel like they're a part of the journey in the story. And if all you got to show them is your mixtape, you know, that, that story gets really short. So, you know, I kind of just always stuck with that narrative and the engagement has been great. You know, people, there are people who follow me because of memes and gifts, <laughs> not because of music. Like there are people who follow me because of jokes. There are people who follow me because of, you know, quotes and, you know, um, you know, little ideas and opinions that I have. And, and then there are also people that follow me because of music. So uh, it's like a jack of all trades, if you will. Yeah. And I mean, th- I think that's such a good point that you make because Right, you, like you said, you have you have those two different kind of artists. You have the artist who uses their social media to let you be involved with their life, have conversations, just have everybody involved. And then you have the artist who every you know month or every two months is like, hey, new single out, or hey, check out my new album, or hey, here's my music video. And right. you know, just the way, and I'm sure you see it on Facebook. If you were to just post, hey buy my album, maybe 150 people, 
even see that post on Facebook. Right. You might get like one like or two likes. Right, right, but if, right. But if you just come out and you tell a joke or you say, hey, what do you guys think of this? And boom, 150 comments. And you, right. didn't, you didn't sell anything, but you got people like invested in you so that maybe right. the next time that that post comes up, hey, buy my album, these people that you've been talking to will be like, yeah, you know what, I'll, I'll give it a listen or yeah, I'll buy it. So it's, it's uh, and I know with social media, it's always changing. Like what works today in two weeks might not work. So it's just, right. it's just sort of throwing everything at the wall and see what works. Yeah, and, yeah. And each platform does it differently. So, oh yeah. They so do. yeah. So you have to, you know, tweet different, Facebook different, Instagram different. Um, Absolutely. But it works. And, uh. I know your sermonettes are just what? They're just on Insta stories, right? Because right. those really wouldn't work on another platform. Right. That's exactly right. Well, uh, I mean, and don't get me wrong. You know, don't get me wrong. Because I think I, I think I kind of figured that out organically, though. Mm -hmm. You know, I think um, I always felt like it, announcements work for music. They They really do. But, but with the way that these algorithms are continuing to change, um, the way that, you know, obviously personal security settings on people's computers and phones and devices and social network platforms are changing, like, you kind of got to be fluid in your approach yeah. and realize that if there's a maximum window for a given post on Instagram, it may be three hours. And beyond that, you have to get the most engagement possible within like the first 10 to 15 minutes to even, to even get it to the point where people beyond your circle can see what you're posting. So not only does it have to be um, a, a thing that forces or prompts engagement, but it has to be interesting enough yeah. quickly for you to even have something to sell. Yeah, because three hours later, especially with the fluctuation of uh, the order, because people are trying to get back to chronological order on Instagram yeah. again. And three hours later, it's like, it's dead. It's gone. <laughs> like, nobody, nobody knows unless within that first, you know, 10 to 15 minutes, that engagement is so significant that, you know, it stays in front of people. You yeah. Know, so uh, I mean, you know, it's it's interesting. It's it's give and take, but you know, I'm the odd guy though. Like I'm the guy that keeps people thinking that they're really, really, really attached to the personal life. But then I'm also the guy who, depending upon how the engagement is looking, I tend to unfollow my own posts. Like, <laughs> you know, like, it's like just I too much happening. Yeah, I'll post something and then unfollow my own post. Like, I'm like, you know, this is ridiculous. Um, and then I'll chime in if somebody says something, like, crazy, because then you kind of got to police it. Like, hey, hey, don't be disrespectful. But, you know, all in all, man, <laughs> I'm kind of like, I'm a hoot sweet guy, just in case people know. I'm yeah, a hoot sweet guy. I, I see that. So. <laughs> you have everything You have everything scheduled. Yeah, yeah, I'm a hoot sweet guy, so... You know, and a lot of times it's just auto scheduling anyway. So I've got posts for months, <laughs> <laughs> like a hoot suite. So it gives off the um, it, it gives off the impression of uh, being on social media all the time, which has its pros and cons. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it also kind of gives me the opportunity to free up time to not try to be so life. profound all the time <laughs> every every yeah. hour <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it's a lot it's of like, pressure right, man yeah and then you know i got you know hamburger helper to make man i can't <laughs> i can't be sitting up here like trying to come up with some amazing uh illustration like <laughs> every every hour on the hour it just it's just not even practical for me yeah i've, I've seen because it says you know posted through hootsuite and I'm like, yo, this guy definitely takes like one day a week or, or, or like a couple days a month and you just sit the whole day and you schedule out a bunch of stuff. And you then, know what's funny? And then you I'm just I'm going to tell go. you something else. I'm going to tell you something else. I don't. Like, 
a lot of times I, if I think of something and I write it down, it automatically goes in the auto schedule. Okay. Like, and it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, you know, and sometimes I'll go through, you know, posts that I've had, you know, years prior and say, Hmm, let me revisit this. You can recycle I'll schedule that. Yeah. Like, and, and, you know, a lot of it's brand new, but you know, sometimes, sometimes you said something that was really dope that you like think people should see again. And, you know, so I, you know, I'll recycle it every once in a while, but, um, it works out. Um, uh, people, people respond. And I think that's really the point. Um, and then when it's time to release a project, people are excited. They want to see you win. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Especially in, in like the CHH community and, and like some smaller circles like that. Um, and right. especially when you have a, like a good crew to back you up and everybody's always promoting each other. Um, right. which I guess while, while we're on that, how, you know, what sort of opportunities does being a part of God over money afford you that maybe you wouldn't have been able to do on your own? Um, well, I would say there's more of a guaranteed understanding that when I'm going to drop something, all the attention and focus is on me, right? Right. Um, and I have people that have platforms that are willing to sacrifice of their time to make sure that I win. Yeah. And that's um, awesome. Yeah. And, and so for me, you know, it's, it's, what is, what is the, uh, what is the, the quote? Um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go farther, go together. So, you know, it's kind of, um, uh, you know, or, you know, the even more cliche teamwork makes the dream work. Right. <laughs> yep. So like, so who tweeted? Like, you, you, <laughs> 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 right. So it's kind of like, Hey man, um, when, when you're, when you've got a team of people and you see this all the time, if the team is effective, uh, a team is, uh, artist is only going to be as effective as their team. So, you know, you look at, uh, the ones that are successful right now, you got dream junkies, like you've got right. reach records, you've mm -hmm. got, um, indie tribe, you've got, uh, God over money, you've got, uh, guys, but then you've got other people that, that succeed, um, without these super teams, you know what I mean? Like you, you've got yeah. people that, uh, you know, have managed to keep themselves afloat, uh, and stay relevant with the, uh, with the weight of their own brand. And I think that that's beautiful. I think that I could have done that. You know, I think I could have done that. Um, but, but I also think that the reason I came to GOM was, uh, the fellowship, it was the accountability. It was the, the people there. Like, I felt like I wanted to win with these guys. Yeah. And, and I think that that's important, you know, um, because it's not just a business proposition. You know, we, we, you know, iron sharpens iron. We're, we're always, uh, chopping it up every single day, pretty much, uh, seeing how everybody's doing, what they're going on, if they need to vent, if they, you know, talk about basketball, football, you know, whatever religion, like we do that all day. So, you know, we're always, you know, sharpening iron. So that's what made sense to me. And that's why, uh, it benefited me to be uh, with the label for the time being. Plus, you know, like I said, I'm a dad. You know, I got kids. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it's difficult to be the guy that's always on your phone trying to promote your stuff by yourself. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's tough to do. Um, and uh, it just made a lot of sense at the time. And with that, thank you. You gave me two assists in a row. You sort of led into God over money, which was one of my questions. And my other question, and you just laid it up for me, was as a husband and a father, how do you balance hip hop and your family? And I'm sure you have a day job. So, I mean, is the eventual goal to provide through music or are you just sort of feeling everything out? Yeah, I would say this. Like... Whatever God wants to give up, you know, I'm going to take it. Um, so I'm kind of in this place where, you know, obviously uh, fatherhood is dope. Fatherhood is dope. But, mm -hmm. you know, I've had to kind of compartmentalize the life, if you will, to make sure that 
I'm not taking away from my first ministry, which is home. Um, right. You know, I've been, a, I, I would like to say, you know, I think I've been a pretty productive artist, right? Over the last three to four years, I've literally given, um, not, not three to four, three to five years, I've literally given three EPs, a mixtape, I get two EPs, a mixtape, and three albums. Um, and probably, my daughter was born in 2015, so in three years. It hasn't even been three years, and I've put out that much content. And one is because of the grace of God. But two, I think it's just the ability to balance uh, life. Um, you know, making sure that if I'm gonna write a song, I'm writing a song while my family is asleep, so I'm not taking that time mm-hmm. away from them. Um, you know, or or if I'm at work, I'll be honest. Like this is my job is is so cool in the sense that I have nothing but time. You know, uh, I got probably about a week or two weeks. Maybe I gotta hit it hard at work, but the other two weeks I don't have anything but time. So I spend that time writing and listening to beats and, and, you know, creating right there at the desk. Um, and, and it works for me. I think uh, God set it up that way, honestly. Um, and it, it, uh, it's benefited me thus far. I think um, the, the, the balancing marriage with music is more difficult than balancing parenting with music. And uh, okay. it's, it's an interesting statement, uh, but you know, kids don't need that much when they're two years old. Like, <laughs> like they don't need that much. You know, eat, sleep. You know, play a little bit. You know, uh, uh, you know, go to sleep, poop, whatever. You know, and and that's it. You know, make che- chicken nuggets or uh, fish sticks or you know macaroni and cheese or something like that. That part is actually simple. The more difficult process is balancing marriage with music um, primarily because you've always got to kind of juggle like how far is too far, how much time is too much time, you know? And and I think that that comes with communication with your spouse. Um, You know, and I say that to say this, it hasn't always been easy because it is a, it is a balance and you want to be able to do it, so that you're giving it the proper attention, but you also don't want it to become an idol. Like, and you also yeah. don't want to take, take what your spouse's time is and sacrifice that for music, even if that music is providing an income. You know what I mean? So uh, it's, it's a balance, man. Uh, but it's a, it's a necessary thing because I think um, you would find the kind of uh, dilemma in anything, really. You know, you would find that if, I, if you were a, a pastor, uh, it doesn't change, you know, because then everybody needs you and everybody wants to be prayed for and everybody yep. wants to be preached to. And, you know, so, so it's no different. Um, sometimes I used to, I used to wish, <laughs> funny story, I used to wish that I was like, yo, why couldn't I just be like boring? Like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, yo, life will be so much easier, man. Like, it really would. But, like, at the same time, I really think that God uh, put me in this position to learn how to balance it all. Because if I didn't learn how to balance it all, there would be no symmetry. There would be no harmony. And if there was no harmony, the music would start to suck. (laughs) Because all I would be doing is devoting it to music and not my family. So I'd lose the family and then, you know, have all my CDs, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> and that would be it. If so I think it's necessary. Um, I think it's necessary for accountability. I think it's necessary for sensitivity. I think it's necessary for your prayer life. I think it's necessary to have, uh, that responsibility, uh, whatever it is. I'm not, you know, saying that as an unmarried guy, but, I think that responsibility is necessary um, because it keeps us at the feet of the cross, man. Um, It keeps us focused. It keeps us committed to serving, which is the entire point of why we're here anyway. Nice answer, man. That was good. 
you really broke it down. And I feel it 100%, especially also what you were saying about getting stuff done while your family's asleep. Because normally, under normal circumstances, this podcast is recorded when my wife and the baby go to sleep. Um, right. It's also when it's most quiet. So <laughs> that's that's also <laughs> that's Word. that's one of the key components too. Or if I'm if I'm uh, doing music with my band, or you know if I'm going to the gym, or if I'm doing something, it's always like after nine o'clock when everyone's asleep. When you know I don't have that obligation of being you know a father or a husband. So right, right. I'm with you. And actually, I don't know if you can hear it. My my baby's yeah, yelling. She's yelling in the background. So. That's baby feedback. Um, yeah, absolutely. So um, switching gears a little bit, as, as an artist so far, what would you say is your biggest uh, quote-unquote rock star moment or biggest success as Jared Sanders, the artist? Um, biggest success um, is Jared Sanders, the artist. So we get to, I get to include everything. Okay. Um, <laughs> the... <laughs> I think um, a big moment for me on the secular side was um, getting introduced uh, by Skyhook on uh, the Wake Up Show with Swain King Tech and DJ Revolution. Nice, nice. Um, it was really, really dope. Um, they they played me on uh, the uh, Wake Up Show multiple times, and they actually selected me as uh, the top 75 emerging artists in 2015 and 2016, which was um, actually the same year that, like, D1 was on there and okay. Logic were on there and, and Odyssey was on there and so many other people, man. Um, you know, so to even be recognized, um, that was a really big moment. And the crazy part about it, what makes it so dope, is that that was the same year that I had transitioned from secular rap to being Christian. Okay. So it was like instant so, validation. Like immediately when I transitioned, the song that Skyhook heard initially was my first record where I, you know, declared that I was a Christian. So the record that she heard out of all the records I had ever released prior to that was a record where I was talking about Christ. So that was a stamp. Um, and then, you know, ultimately the song that I sent her, it was corrupt or whatever, like the, the file, when I sent oh, an man. email, like it kept skipping, it was crappy. So she went and Googled herself, my old music and she found some of it. Um, and that ended up being the stuff that got rotated, but small victories, man, small victories. Yeah. Um, but the, when I came to the Christian side, I would say that, uh, uh a big, uh, thing was obviously coming over to GOM, but prior to that, I got on GOM's radar because I was at the uh, Kingdom Choice Awards and I won up next um, and was nominated for uh, Best Lyricist um, that year. Uh, so nice. so it was, uh, it, was, it was just a good confirmation uh, at that time. Yeah, con- considering you were the guy who should only stick to, you know, those little rap parts in Usher songs, um, <laughs> word, <laughs> you word. did pretty good. Um, exactly. So, what about on the other end? What do you What do you think so far? Do you have any failures or regrets as an artist? Um, do I have any regrets? Um, the cliche response would be no, not at all, because I learned. God is with me, you know. <laughs> or everything is an experience, and I like yeah, that that sounds cool. But like, if there was a regret, I wouldn't say a regret per se, but I would say that. If I had an advice, if I had advice to give anybody, it would be like, "Yo, listen to God." <laughs> it, it will make the process that much easier, like because I really believe, like, if I had the, the dedication and the commitment to pursuing Christ, um, then that I do now, I really truly believe, you know, and this is not trying to blow smoke or nothing, but I really truly believe, like, I would be where Andy and Lecrae and those guys are. Mm-hmm. Like, I just, you know, or biz, you know, I feel like I'll be right there. Um, not label wise, but, but presence wise. Yeah. Like, I feel like, I feel like, cause at that time, I think that was prime season 
for Christian rap. Like when I started rapping, like trying to take it seriously, that was prime season. Yeah, it was Christian exploding. Rap. It was yeah, it was exactly. coming into its like, own. Right. So and that was right around like 2010, 2011. Like so there was a a groundswell if you will at that time. And um I believe that had I come in at that time, I probably would have been met with a lot of opposition cuz I was still pretty rough around the edges, but at the same time, I think that I wouldn't have had people trying to compare me to anything. I would have been like myself. I would have mm -hmm. been willing to, I would have been able to, to come out and, and release the music I wanted to and be known and identified for, oh, that's the hope hop guy. Like, right. I would have been able to do that from day one. Like, and uh, I just, at that time, I just didn't think it was cool. <laughs> so <laughs> I, was like, I was like, all right. And, and even at that time, even they, you know, admittedly have said on countless occasions, like they don't, you know, a lot of it they thought wasn't cool. Um, so, you know, I feel like if I did it then and I was uh, proactive about it, I probably would have uh, been in a different position. So if, I guess you could say that's a regret, but I think, I think I'm also right where I wanted to be, like where I need to be. Um, so it, it kind of worked itself out. Yeah. Okay. I feel you. So it's more so of a timing thing and nobody really has control over timing per se. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, all right. So now, so you spilled your own beans on this a couple of months ago. So I'm going to say it. So you, you allegedly, you allegedly have an album called hurry up and wait. And we've all yeah. been, We've all been waiting and wishing that you would hurry up and put it out. So can you can you talk about it a little bit? Can you give me something? Yeah, yeah. You know, it actually works. Uh, truthfully, it actually works for promotional purposes. Uh, I got to give you. the album title <laughs> and then make people wait, right? Like, <laughs> it, I mean, it kind of it kind of pays itself, pays pays for itself at that point in time. But yeah. Um, it's, it's an album that I worked on at a really tough time, um, really, really tough time in my life. Um, I started working on it literally right after I came to GOM, but shortly after I came to GOM, a couple months later, I lost my job. Like, I was unemployed, mm -hmm. um, collecting unemployment, pretty much. Um, and during that season, that was a tough, tough, tough season. And... Uh, you know, I think that the thing that God had been trying to tell me the entire time um, is, you know, be ready, but you got to wait on me to tell you to go, though. Um, and and I think that that's a difficult place for believers to be in, honestly, the hurry up and wait phase, because a lot of times what people do is they 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 hear a word or they feel compelled or inspired uh, to just like they they see something that God is trying to show them. And they think that that's the green light. Yeah. Like when really it may not be the green light. It may just be the thing that puts you at ease and lets you know, I got this. But what we do is when we see the image, we see that vision, we see that idea. It's like, okay, now it's my job to go get it. And ultimately I found that every time I found God trying to compel me to do something when I was trying to fill the gap, everything got worse. Like it made it harder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so the album was really, you know, God working on me through that entire process, like beating me up and, you know, like, Hey, you know, Nope, you didn't move. You moved too much. You're too worried about music right now. Look at your marriage. Sucks. <laughs> you know, like you're too worried about, you know, making dope music. You're too worried about these things. Like, worry about home. Worry about those things. And I'm going to give you everything else. But you got to wait until you get all this other stuff right. And, and so I created it during that season. And I think it's some of the best music I've made. You know, I think, um, I think it's some of the best music I've made because I still feel where I was coming from when I listen to it now. Like I know, like, yeah. and I'm at the point now where I'm kind of like, and this is, this is, <laughs> I, I know, like now I know what it's like or what it really feels like 
to like truly be an artist and have to live the album, like live the music. And I keep it real though, like contrary to what a lot of people say, like, yo, I don't want to go through that again to make this kind of music. I don't want to go through yeah. that. I want to make happy, triumphant music. Like, I don't want to uh, have to have to experience the pain necessary to emote that pain on wax. Like, I just I just don't feel like doing that again. So, um, it's a snapshot into my life. I, I hope people rock with it. Um, I think they will, uh, but man, it sucked to go through it though. Do do we do we have a a time frame of when this will be coming out? Ah, uh, yeah, it'll be coming out uh, this summer. I can't say the date, but there is a date. Uh, it'll be coming. There is, there is, a, is date. a date. There is a date. I can't say the date, but it will be between now and September. Like <laughs> so, so it's coming this summer though. It's before fall. I promise. This is like um, a, a blockbuster coming. movie just coming this summer, but you don't you don't know when, but it it'll, right, right. it'll be before it's not summer. Um, yes, yes, exactly. And and rumor has it that you were not only recording that album in the studio, but you were recording like lots of stuff in the studio. Ah oh, man, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I'm 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 actually what's the word? Um, I'm I'm six projects ahead. <laughs> that's, that's absurd. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I've got this one, but I, I finished this one looking at what's next. Um, so, so I can guarantee people this, I can guarantee that in addition to this album, there are six projects that are being worked on at the same time. So uh, at this rate, though, by the time that last one comes out, you're going to be so far removed in your life. <laughs> you might, you yeah, might be on, you, know, you might be on your fourth kid or something by then. <laughs> you know, I, I'm gonna be honest, man. I think I'm gonna keep it at two right now. I think I like two. <laughs> um, but but I'll say this: all six of them will be out before 2020 is over with. Okay, I'll take that. So. Yeah, all six of them will be out before 2020 is over with. Um, I know that the, after this, there are there's a, there's a really really dope project. That I just can't, I'm not making the mistake of telling people what it is. It's not. <laughs> but, that, um, ne- next time, I'll get it next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, man, it's it's got some dope collaborations already, some dope features already. Um, and I, I really think it's going to show the range quite a bit cool. more. Um, yeah. You, you sound like a record label's dream. Like when they sign an artist to like a four, four to six project deal. And then after the first year, you're like, yo, I'm done. I'm contractually, I'm done. Here are your six projects. Put them <laughs> out whenever you feel like it. I'm, I'm moving on. I'm going somewhere else. <laughs> well, you know, you know, like I think. I think that before I ever came to GOM, I had a plan. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of artists don't have a plan. I think a lot of artists sign to record deals or sign to record labels and want the label to plan their future. And I think that that doesn't benefit the artist. I think because, because if you can't tell your story, if you don't know who you are and you don't know how you want to pitch yourself to society or culture, the people that want to potentially buy your music, then somebody else holds all the strings. Like they're trying to sell who they think you should be. Mm -hmm. They're trying to market how they think you should be marketed. Now, granted, marketing is cool. Partnering with somebody is cool. But I think that like, if you don't, people a lot of times don't even they guide themselves based on what they want as opposed to who they are. Yeah. And I think that you have to know who you are to know what you want. Um because if you if you go, you know, to the want before you know who you are, you're kinda, you know, flighty. You just go with anything. You'll go with whatever's trendy, whatever pops, whatever sounds cool, and you you're kinda whimsical and 
floating along. But I think if you know yourself, then you can actually have those hard conversations with yourself. Like, who do you want to be? Who do you want to put yourself or how do you want to present yourself? And I think that I came to GON with a plan. I came in with Hope Hop before I ever came to GON. Yeah. Um, I had an idea. I had a plan on how to get to that goal. And so when I came to GOM, it was a natural, fluid process. I was like, oh, yeah, there, there is more. You know, there's going to be more. Um, and I just had to come in with the plan, man. A lot of people just don't have plans like that. You're prepared. That's, that's, yeah, that's part be. of it. It's like chess, man. You got to think like chess. Like, you know, it's, chess, is, chess is the game of life, right? If you really master the chessboard, life makes so much sense. Hoot sweet, like, hoot like, sweet that, yeah. hoot sweet that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like if you master the game of chess, man, life makes so much sense. And you've got to be thinking about two moves ahead in anything almost. Unless you're like working on a uh, working on an assembly line or something like that, where the next piece is the most important piece. But you know, if you're doing entertainment, if you're trying to be in the arts, you've got to be open to new ideas. But you got to have foresight and and passion and drive and vision to go beyond what's right in front of you. Because mm-hmm. we have the job as artists to guide the culture. We have a job to do, like show people what's next, not just be guided by, you know, public perception, but we're supposed to be the people that create the perception itself. So, you know, I, you know, I think you got to have vision, man. I think you got to play chess. What do, what do you want to show people? How do you want people to be introduced to it? I think that's important. And uh, aside, aside from this next record, coming out sometime this summer. Do you have anything else going on or uh, anything you're about to do? Uh, well, you know, um, it's, it's show season, man. It's show season. It's time to, <laughs> to get back out here, man. The kid and, you know, after, after having a baby, you know, or, you know, well, my wife having a baby. After watching um, the trauma that, of your wife having yeah, a baby. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. After that, like, I was like, yo, I got to get down, man. I'm, I'm, I'm 21 pounds down, man. I'm trying to be down to <laughs> under uh, under 200 by uh, two weeks from now, man. So I got a little go, but um, get to my ideal weight so I could, you know, be the best dad I could be for my kids and, you know, for my wife and uh, get back on these shows and not be winded. Keeping that breath control going. <laughs> ah, yeah, man. I want to be, yo, I want to have, I want to be on stage. When, and you know hopping around and stuff and people be like yo this dude has an extra lung i want to be that guy <laughs> like like and so it's work to do man you know i gotta get these intervals in these sprints in try and make sure i'm ready to go oh you good man you good and you're chronicling that journey for everybody too which is funny word um word. and and the final thing i mean what would be your final thought like what is the key to the survival of the artist in 2018? What, what's the Jared Sanders tip? Uh, do your research. Um, yeah, do your research about what's trending in the market right now. Uh, do your research to understand how things are going. Um, but be willing to be a disruptor if you've got to. Uh, because to grow in this market, despite all of the little shiny objects that people are chasing, your job is to connect with people. So your bread and butter, your livelihood rests upon how you connect with people. So beyond all the the sexy Spotify streams and stats, you've got to be able to connect with people. So despite the trends and despite the patterns, the people that are staying afloat right now are the ones that have strong connections to people. Yep. That needs to be the goal. Yep. That needs to be the only thing that you stick to. Because when all these streaming services disappear, which I think is inevitable, just like I never thought blogs would expire, 
look what happened. Um, what happens is the more connected to people you are, the more stable you become, the more your foundation is concrete. And no matter what changes, you'll still be able to survive because you have a connection to your support system and your base. So pay attention, research, see what's going on. Maybe you can learn a couple tips and tricks, but hey, man, focus on the people that support you. Don't make music for artists. Make music for fans. God, I should have said that first. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make music for other artists. Make music for a fan. Because artists are not out here like that buying music. And even if they are, they're not the, the base. It's of, not your fan uh, base. They're not, the, they're they're not, not supporting you. Family. Yeah, they're not supporting you. They're the competition. Contrary to popular belief. Like, unless they really are, you know, trying to see you win. But even that is, is, is kind of short-sighted. It's like, hey, if, if you sell more than them, you know, some, some artists will be like, hey, man, uh, I might need to slow down on this promotion. <laughs> but, you know, but, but yeah, man, make music for fans. Bang, bang. Hashtag hop. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Jared Sanders. Episode 5 of Survival of the Artist podcast, dropping knowledge bombs, dropping bombs on them, just like the DJs, coming yeah. coming out of the house, fixing the hot water, which they won't hear about because that was before <laughs> the podcast started, but he had a water situation and he still took care of it. Facts. Outside with the birds chirping, my baby's yelling, it's all good. <laughs> we had we had a dope podcast. He talked about his album, which you're not supposed to know about, but you're gonna know facts. about it. Facts, 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 facts on facts on facts. But uh, thank you so much, man. Um, I will be I will be uh, I guess seeing you on the Twitter sphere and on Facebook, connecting usually. And uh, oh, and uh, and a little secret: there's gonna be a show at the end of June. And Jared Sanders is going to be a part of the show, and I'm going to be a part Back. of the show, not as an artist. Um, but don't worry, that news is coming too. But uh, all right, Back. thank you, Jared. Thanks for your time, bro. Get back to your no family. Doubt, I'm going to get back to my family or doing whatever I got to do now. <laughs> word, word. But uh, all right, thanks everyone for listening. Jared Sanders, stay tuned for Hurry Up and Wait while you're listening. Or while you're waiting, I should say, listen to Nobody Famous and the Versatility mixtape. Word, word. Got over money. All right, man. Talk to you later.